Start. Before we begin, a quick thanks to EA for sponsoring this video and giving me the chance to try out their new game before release. Hey, it's Lemon. Welcome to the Backlogs. Hope you're all doing well. If you're like me, you probably find yourself lying awake late at night, staring vacantly at the ceiling while your brain tries to solve the great mysteries of the universe. Why do hot dogs come in packs of 10, but hot dog buns come in packs of 8? If you make a fire bigger, are you making the fire worse or better? And what would happen if you combined a magical wizarding world with modern day military tactics? Well, while the first two questions are clearly impossible to answer, I may have an answer for the third. Welcome to Immortals of Avium. For context, EA reached out to me and asked me if I would play a demo build of their game for a few hours, and has asked me to give my honest impressions of the game so far. I was given access to several missions, which let me dive into most of the mechanics of the game, and also gave me a good idea of what to expect from the full game when it releases. But before we go diving into the game itself, let's address the immediate questions on everyone's mind. Immortals of Avium was developed by Ascendant Studios, a new gaming studio that consists of several veterans. These guys are responsible for such games as Dead Space and Call of Duty, so while the studio itself may be new, they've got some experience under their belts. The game will be published by EA under their EA Originals program, is planned for release on July 20th, and will launch on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, and PC. It's a single player game, is reported to be about 25 hours of gameplay, utilizes Unreal Engine 5.1, requires no internet connection to play, and has no plans for in-game microtransactions as of this recording. Still with me? Good, because now that we've gotten the important information surrounding the game out of the way, we can get to the fun stuff, the game itself. First off, let's talk about what Immortals even is. Immortals of Avium is a first-person magic shooter, which is exactly what it sounds like. You'll play as Jack, a young man who suddenly develops magic powers later in life, and finds himself being recruited to fight against a rising tide of evil that threatens to take over the entire world. Said world consists of three types of magic. Red magic, the embodiment of entropy and violence, Blue magic, the embodiment of force and physical manipulation, and green magic, the embodiment of growth, death, and transition. These magics were used by the people of Avium for multiple purposes, but with the entire world consumed by war, we'll be using these three magics as weapons. We start the game right in the thick of things. The people of the Lucium Kingdom find themselves on the brink, with every other nation in the world having either been destroyed or scattered by Rasharn, an invading force that is slowly but surely taking everything in their wake. Which brings us to Jack. While most magic users in this world are born with the ability to cast one of the three types, Jack is a Triarch, which means he can use all three types of magic instead of just one. Being a Triarch means he's not as strong as those who focus on one specific spell type, but he's more versatile, and that just might be enough to give his army a fighting chance. And that's the story so far. But you didn't come here for the lore, you came here for the action. And action you will most certainly find. Remember those three magic types we just talked about? Turns out, they translate pretty well into weapon types that FPS players will be more familiar with. Red magic acts as your shotguns and short-range weapons, with widespread and heavy damage. Blue magic is your assault rifles and snipers, focusing on accuracy and longer range. And green magic is your rapid-fire automatics, with medium range and upwards of 80 casts at a time. These weapons, called sigils, can be switched on the fly, letting you switch between damage types in the heat of battle and making sure that you have just the right weapon for the occasion. And you will need to switch. Each sigil does its specific colored damage, and some enemies are stronger against certain types of magic than others. So if you plan on pushing back the encroaching waves, you'll find yourself using all three. Oh, and don't worry, there's no actual ammo in Immortals of Avium. When you find your primary weapon running low, simply press the reload button and you'll re-energize back to a full magical magazine. You'll also find multiple types of each sigil, each with their own ammo count, fire rate, and style. Red magic has shotgun blasts, yes, but it also has giant death lasers. Blue magic has magical long-range spears, which are pretty frickin' neat, and green magic has, um, even bigger automatic fire. Look, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And that's just what I was able to find in the demo. Chances are, there's even more weapon styles available elsewhere in the game. But that's not all. While you'll be casting your main source of damage with your right hand, you'll be doing utility-based spellcasting with your left. Throughout my time with the game, I found multiple tools to help me fight enemies. There was the Lash, which let me pull enemies down into ravines or into red magic range, the Limpets, which made anything and anyone I hit with it move slower, the Red Lens, which would let me stun enemies and leave them open to attack, and the Shield, which provided a solid defense against enemy attacks while still allowing me to fire back. All of these offhand weapons bring a second layer of strategy to the gameplay, bringing depth to combat and ensuring that this isn't just a reskinned Call of Duty clone. They also act on a recharge timer, so don't be afraid to use them, and use them often. 
But what happens if you want a two-hand magic? Well, Immortals has got you covered there too. Stronger forms of magic, called Furies, are learned as you progress throughout the game, and require both hands to cast. These Furies tend to be large, full-screen attacks, and do require mana to cast, seen in the bottom right. And while they aren't something you can cast over and over again, man oh man do they pack a punch. Each Fury is designed for a specific application, like casting spikes underneath an enemy's magic shield, or blasting back groups of enemies that get too close, but that doesn't mean you can only use them for that intended purpose. A mage who can't improvise is a dead mage, after all. And finally, there's your ultimate, which is exactly what it sounds like. If you've been casting spells from each of the different schools of magic, you'll slowly build up your ultimate ability's energy bar, and upon filling it, you can now unleash death on the entire battlefield with a single press of a button. There were also a few other utility spells, like a dodge blink that let me warp through enemy attacks, and a double jump and hover that let me get around the map with ease, but that's about all the magic I had available to me when I played through the demo. It might sound a bit overwhelming at first, but you won't get all of these abilities at once, and as you get more comfortable with the controls and the flow of the game, you find yourself picking your favorite ways to play and building up that muscle memory pretty quick. Because while you will need to use all three types of magic, there's no reason you can't have a favorite, and when you do find that favorite, why not lean into it? Which brings us to the RPG side of Immortals, the gear and skill trees. But don't worry, this isn't nearly as complicated as it looks on the surface. Gear can be found around the world at large, crafted, and upgraded, and consists of materials that you'll find during your missions. Equipping gear will give you a boost to your stats, and often includes a special ability that helps boost your magic in a specific way. So if you find yourself using one type of magic over the others, or need more charges for a certain tool, go ahead, treat yourself. You can also create different versions of the weapons you've found, which tends to reallocate their stats a bit. So if you needed a faster casting rate, more ammunition, or better damage for your favorite weapon, chances are you can do just that. And yes, you can also craft your own gear as well. So if you haven't found a piece of your equipment that fits your build properly, don't worry. You can just make it yourself. Moving on to the next tab, you'll be happy to know that the skill tree is also relatively straightforward. As you defeat enemies, you'll gain experience. When you cap out the experience bar, you get a skill point and that can be plugged into the skill tree wherever you choose. Each node offers something different to help boost your build, whether it's increased damage, health regeneration, or even new modifiers for your melee attacks. The further into the tree you get, the more each node will cost, and some nodes even require that you have a few points put into the other magic trees before you can use them. And while I was initially upset that I couldn't pump into just one type of magic, a quick look at the other skill trees proved that they have plenty of options that'll be helpful for any build. And for those of us who hate getting locked into one style of play, don't worry. You can respec your skill tree for a pretty low cost at any time. So, aside from blasting your way through the story, is there anything else this game is offering? Well, while I don't have any hands-on time with the feature, as it wasn't in the demo, I was told that players will have a hub that they can visit, which will give them side quests to take, easier access to crafting forges, and the ability to travel back to locations you've already been. Not only would this let you gain more experience if you feel like your build needs a little more time to cook, but on your first pass through a level, you're bound to find all sorts of doors and puzzles that you don't have the tools for yet. So coming back later on in the game will probably net you some hidden loot. That's right, there's puzzles and immortals. Now, granted, the ones I messed around with in the demo weren't exactly brain busters, and felt more like tests of skill, asking me to use my weapons and tools in a specific way while simultaneously testing my ability to maneuver around the map. Nothing overly complicated, but they did act as a breather from all the combat, which was much appreciated. This also probably explains why there's a map in the game. On my first pass through a level, I never found myself lost or confused on where to go, as the game does a good job of leading you along to the next plot point, and offers a little marker on the screen to help point you in the right direction. But if one was trying to find every secret, solve every puzzle, and complete every quest, this map seems like it would be more than enough to get the job done. So, with all of that out of the way, it's time to ask the most important question of all. Is it fun? Oh, thank God. Full disclosure, when I initially watched the trailers and did a little research into the game before playing the demo, I was a bit nervous. The trailers kinda do the game a disservice, making it seem all about the flashy effects and more than a little aimless. But thankfully, that is not the case. Magic all feels good to use, and while I absolutely favored my red magic build, I made sure to give the other branches a try as well, and found them both to be pretty well balanced. Which is good, because that means it's less about using the magic that does the most damage, and more about leaning into the magic that fits your playstyle. The skill tree felt balanced as well, keeping any one tree from being the only option a player should ever use. I especially liked how varied each node is from its fellows, and how you don't need to fill out an entire tree to find a build that suits you. Considering I'm less about accuracy and more about being up close and personal, I very quickly adopted a red magic build that had increased damage, damage over time effects that applied whenever I used melee, and increased blink uses from the green magic tree. 
I was also very fond of my green magic build in the later game, because picking skills that increase your fire rate and make your 80 bullets home in on your enemies is, unsurprisingly, pretty dang fun. Speaking of enemies, there appears to be a wide variety. I fought against mechanical constructs, long-range blue magic snipers, green magic users who acted as healers for the rest of their army, red magic melee users who rush at you, and even a dragon at one point. There are boss battles, and they all feel pretty good for the most part. Some of them are just a general being supported by waves of soldiers, others require you to master maneuverability to defeat them, and still others require you to be able to aim while simultaneously keeping proper positioning. I didn't fight too many of them, so I can't say for certain if this variety will keep up throughout the entire game, but the few I did fight felt fun to beat. Also, something that took a little longer for me to realize than it should have, if a boss feels like a bullet sponge and like it's taking forever, switch up your tactics. This isn't a normal shooter where pulling your trigger means the enemy takes damage. You need to work with the enemy's weakness. Or just blast them with your ultimate. That works too. Overall, combat felt really good in my hands. The fast pace and high maneuverability keeps things interesting, the magic all has some proper oomph behind it, and the music that plays during combat is upbeat without being overwhelming. I did die a few times while playing on normal, but never felt like my deaths were unfair. And respawns are quick and place you right before wherever you died. If I had to compare it to a game you might be familiar with, I'd probably pick Doom. The action isn't quite that fast paced, and I'm pretty sure the soundtrack wasn't made with lawnmowers, but you can probably tell from my footage that constant movement and aggression is encouraged, and chest high walls are nowhere to be found. As for the story, the demo skipped from the early levels to later levels, so I can't speak for it in its entirety, but the bits I did see definitely have my interest. The character models all look amazing, the voice actors and actresses do a fantastic job, and the dialogue itself is actually pretty great. It's a good balance of soldier banter, tactics, and fantasy-focused conversation, and there were a few moments that gave me a good chuckle. I was fine. <coughs> okay. Muscle Mommy gets what Muscle Mommy wants. The visuals themselves are beautiful as well, and while the flash and awe of your spells can be a bit distracting from what's happening on screen, I never found myself dying because of them. There were a few bits that felt a little underdeveloped, like the mana streams overhead looking a little less polished than everything else, but for a demo, I was more than pleased. I will say that when things got really heated in later levels and literally everyone on screen was blasting the map with magic spells, I did see some frame rate drops in the midst of combat. It didn't happen too often, but it was a bit distracting and knocked me out of the experience when it happened. Here's hoping they can get that fixed up before launch. I also had a slight problem with one of the control choices that they made. I love that all the Furies are bound to the number keys, but when it comes to both your primary and offhand weapons, you have to scroll through them to find the one you want. Which, in the heat of battle, gets a little difficult to do accurately. I also found myself accidentally using mana crystals and health crystals interchangeably, because once again, when you're desperately trying to survive in the middle of a fight, the X and C buttons are close enough to one another that I would occasionally press the wrong one or both at the same time with my big old grippers. And despite the game being pretty generous with the health and mana crystals throughout the levels, I'm still not exactly keen on that control choice. To be thorough, I made sure to speak to another player who was using a controller rather than a mouse and keyboard. This player had a few small issues with the controls as well, stating that they weren't fond of the way that the X button was used for both reloading and interacting with objects, and sometimes found themselves misclicking during fights when trying to use a fury as Furies are cast by holding down the right trigger and then pressing a face button. Now granted, both my fellow controller gamer and myself didn't really take the time to mess around with the controls since we were on a strict time limit, and chances are there was a way we could have tweaked this somewhere in the settings. But if this sounds concerning to you, just make sure you do some research beforehand to confirm that control mapping is indeed possible. Immortals of Avium is an interesting blend of role-playing game and first-person shooter that breathes some new life into both genres. With combat that reinforces a fast-paced, aggressive playstyle, while simultaneously encouraging tactical thinking before rushing in, players from both genres will likely find themselves having a great time. The mechanics of the game work well, the visuals and the lore felt well-crafted and easily grabbed my attention, and overall I found myself wishing I had been able to play more, rather than just the demo slices that were available to me. But that's a good thing, because if I'm stepping away from the demo asking for more, we must be doing something right. There are still a few concerns, like the few frame rate drops I witnessed in the bigger mage battles, but if Ascendant Studios can iron those out before launch, then you can bet that I'll be joining the Everwar and blasting my way through the game on day one. But other than that, that's all I've got. Take care of yourselves, be good to one another, and I'll see you all again soon.